Hello and welcome back to Map and Tea, the show where we talk map and drink tea. I'm your host, Professor Joseph Van de Hei, and today I want to talk about quaternions. Now, quaternions are numbers, but they're numbers probably unlike any other numbers you've seen. You might even ask, do they count as numbers? Well, yes, but we should talk a little bit about the history of numbers before we talk about quaternions. And if we're talking about the history of numbers, we should start with, well, the original numbers. It used to be that the only numbers that were numbers were counting numbers. One, two, three, four, and so on. They were counting whole objects. And as a result of this, certain other things didn't make sense as numbers. Even when zero was around, it was a long time before zero was accepted as a value that you could have because it was an absence of things. Same way with the rational numbers, like three halves. It was seen as three whole parts over two whole parts, not a number that was between one and two. How could you have more than one but less than two whole things of something? And negative numbers? What could those possibly mean? It took a long time for all these different kinds of numbers that we now accept to actually be treated as numbers, often after they had some practical application, like negative numbers representing debts. After we had accepted zero, rationals, irrationals, and negative numbers, the next big thing was complex numbers. And the history of complex numbers starts, surprisingly enough, with the cubic equation. The cubic formula isn't that well known. More commonly, people know the quadratic formula. So if we have an equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, this has solutions in x of minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. Now here there's a square root, and it's possible, given various values of b, a, and c, that b squared minus 4ac is negative. And when this happened, it was just ignored. You can't take the square root of a negative number, they said. That doesn't make any sense. But then along came the cubic formula, which was discovered in the mid-16th century. Now, we would like to have a cubic formula for solving an equation like ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero, but it turns out that's a little bit hard. So we simplify the types of cubics we look at down to x cubed plus px plus q equals zero. The resulting equation has solutions of this form, and I think you see now why this isn't typically taught in high school. In much the same way that a quadratic equation has two solutions, which are found by taking either the plus or minus sign, here we have three possible solutions determined by the three possible values of zeta. Either zeta equals 1, zeta equals minus 1 plus the square root of minus 3 all over 2, or minus 1 minus the square root of minus 3 all over 2. This was more than a little bit groundbreaking. It's entirely possible that there are three solutions to the equation, all of which are standard, regular, real numbers. But the only way to find them was to make use of these values of zeta that involved this square root of minus three, these nonsensical numbers. And so as mathematicians started to look at this, they started to realize that maybe these nonsensical numbers weren't so nonsensical. They were serving a practical and useful purpose. It was largely due to the cubic formula that complex numbers were accepted as numbers. Complex numbers are numbers of the form x plus y i, where x and y could be any real numbers, and i squared is minus 1. That is, i itself is a square root of minus 1. In the same way that real numbers could be placed along a number line, complex numbers could be placed on a plane, with the x and y in the number corresponding to the x and y coordinates of the point. This led to a fascinating discovery of geometric properties of complex numbers in the 1700s. Typically, we think of real numbers as existing along a line. Now let's think about addition and multiplication in terms of the whole number line. What does addition do? Well, it shifts, right? It moves us to the left or right along the number line. Multiplication dilates, right? Multiplication by two sends everything flying apart. Division by two squashes everything together. Complex numbers, remember, can be set in a whole plane, an x-axis and a y-axis. And mathematicians started to play around with, well, what does addition and multiplication mean on the plane of complex numbers? Again, addition shifts. It could shift us to the left, shift us to the right, up and down, but then there's multiplication. Multiplication can, again, dilate, right? It can extend us out, it can squash us in, but it also rotates. 
And that was a big deal, because rotation, generally speaking, is a pretty hard thing to do, and complex numbers made two-dimensional rotations easy. But the holy grail for mathematicians at this time were three-dimensional rotations, because they were even harder still. So mathematicians started to say, well, if complex numbers could tell us about two-dimensional rotations, maybe there's some sort of hyper-complex number which could tell us about three-dimensional rotation. One such mathematician was Sir William Rowan Hamilton, an Irish mathematician and astronomer. He worked for over 10 years trying to find a three-dimensional analog to complex numbers. He could always easily add and subtract them, but as you can see from this excerpt from a letter of his, his difficulty was always in multiplication. Then one day, inspiration hit. On October 16, 1843, Hamilton and his wife were out for a walk. As they crossed over what is now known as Broom Bridge, he realized how to solve the problem, and he was so excited he carved his solution into the soft stone of the bridge, which is why we know the exact date he discovered this. The inscription he wrote probably looks something like the following. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals minus one. Hamilton's particular insight was that instead of working in three dimensions, we needed to work in four, and then only focus on three of the four dimensions. This led to the quaternions. Quaternions, or quaternionic numbers, are numbers of the form w plus xi plus yj plus zk, where w, x, y, and z are any real numbers, and i, j, and k satisfy these relations. Now, if xi, yj, and zk sound a little familiar from, say, multivariable calculus, it's because they have the same meaning here as they do there. However, quaternions fail to satisfy a fairly standard property that we generally assume to hold for all numbers, that is, commutivity. The order doesn't matter. So, for example, with quaternions, i times j is k, but j times i is negative k. Now, this makes perfectly good sense if we're expecting these to act by 3D rotations, because 3D rotations don't commute either. So here is the actual rotation formula by quaternion multiplication. Suppose we want to rotate a point x, y, z around an axis pointing in the direction of a unit vector u, x, u, y, u, z by an angle theta. Then the resulting point is given by this formula. Note that we are multiplying by q on the left, but q inverse on the right. We have to do this for various technical reasons. This might look a little complicated, but it's surprisingly an efficient way of doing this calculation and is frequently used in computer graphics processing. The heyday of quaternions sadly only lasted for a couple decades, and then things like dot products and cross products were introduced and made a lot of geometric calculations even simpler, although rotations we still typically use quaternions for. But there's still one more interesting property about these quaternions to say, at least for this episode. The real numbers, complex numbers, and quaternions are all examples of normed division algebras over the reals, Normed meaning they have a notion of distance, and division algebra meaning they have a notion of division, and over the reals meaning they have real coefficients, basically. But as it turns out, there aren't many normed division algebras. In fact, there's only four of them. Reals, complexes, quaternions, and the octonions, an eight-dimensional space over the real numbers. But that's probably a topic for another episode, because um, I'm out of tea again. Bye!